In 1995, hundreds of people lined the streets of London to pay their respects to a dead criminal. This was no ordinary villain. The man in the coffin was Ronald Cray. He, with his twin brother, Reginald Cray, were two of the most notorious gangsters London has ever seen. In death, as in life, their names were and are part of the mythology of the East End. Who were these two men? And how did they rise to such prominence? This is the story of two brothers who organized and ran a crime syndicate called The Firm. It is the story of two men whose rise from poverty was built on violence and fear, and whose ultimate downfall was more spectacular than their lives of crime. This is the story of the craze. The Cray twins were born in October 1933 in Hoxton. To understand them, we must understand their world. The East End in the 1930s looked remarkably like it had in the 19th century. A squalid, overcrowded area of the city which was rife with crime and violence. East Enders had a sense of pride and resilience. There was a certain code. You showed loyalty to your own people, and you didn't grass to the police. The twins were brought up in a house on Valence Road, Bethnal Green. It was a grim area where the noise of trains heading to Liverpool Street Station kept the twins awake at night. Both of the twins contracted diphtheria, and their mother, Violet Cray, helped nurse them back to health. The twins went to school first in Brick Lane and then at the Daniel Street School. At home, their grandfather, a former boxer named Cannonball Lee, would tell them stories about the criminals and characters he had known in the old days of the East End. Their father, Charles Cray Sr., was not close to the twins or his in laws. While their mother doted on her twin boys, their father was often absent, buying and selling gold and furniture. The twins' relationship with their mother and with each other was very close. Their bond with their father and their brother Charlie was weaker. When the twins were growing up, there were only two ways to become wealthy and successful, boxing or crime. The twins were encouraged to go into boxing by their grandfather. They trained at the Repton Boys Club and became well known for their prowess in the ring. They even fought at the Albert Hall. The Crays might well have become professional boxers, but they got into trouble when Ronnie insulted and punched a policeman. Although they avoided jail, a criminal record effectively put an end to their boxing careers because to box required a license. The twins began to turn to street fights, which were a daily occurrence in the East End. In 1950, the fights moved from Bethnal Green to Hackney and involved everything from bicycle chains to broken bottles. During one battle, a 16-year-old youth was badly beaten up. The twins were identified and the case went to the Old Bailey. But it was dropped when both the victim and the witnesses forgot what they had seen. The Crays learnt to rely on the East End Code of Silence and on a belief that they were too smart for the law. In March 1953, the 18-year-old twins were called up for national service. They reported to the Royal Fusiliers at the Tower of London. They promptly attacked a corporal and deserted. Like their father, the twins hated the idea of life in the army, 
and spent most of their time deserting and being recaptured. They were transferred to the Glasshouse military prison at Shepton Mallet and dishonourably discharged in 1954. During one of their periods of desertion, they had assaulted PC Fisher and received a month each in Wormwood Scrubs Prison. The twins had stayed with Richard Morgan while on the run from the army. It was he who introduced them to the criminal fraternity in Mile End. It was only after they were discharged that their professional criminal careers would begin. London during the 50s was no stranger to crime. Although drugs would not become big until the 60s, areas of London would remain notorious for their unique patterns of crime. King's Cross was for thieves, Hackney for cat burglars, Stepney for conmen, and so on. This was what London was like when the Crays began their criminal career. Drugs did not really feature. Instead, the city's criminals focused on robbery and con tricks. After their discharge from the army, the twins returned to Mile End, taking over the Regal Snooker Club in Eric Street. Their method was simple, violent behaviour until the manager handed it over to them in return for a weekly fee. The snooker hall became a place where criminals could hide what they wanted, providing they paid. The twins began to stockpile weapons, including sawn-off shotguns and a luger which they hid under the floorboards of their parents' house in Valence Road. But the Crays had no real power. Although they ran some small-time rackets from their snooker hall, they were still local crooks. The criminal underworld had two kings. Billy Hill was an ex-thief who ran the crime scene with Jack the Spot Coma. But in 1955, they fell out. Jack Coma sought out the Crays as allies and they went with him to the Epsom Derby as protection. Everyone was expecting a turf war, but it never kicked off. Billy Hill and Jack Comer effectively retired, leaving the stage free for new games. The twins lost no time in building up the firm. Their power soon spread through Hackney to Walthamstow. By 1956, they were protecting a club called the Stragglers off Cambridge Circus. But the law caught up with them. In November, Ron was sent down for three years for assaulting a man named Terence Martin in a gang fight. Ron was sent to Wandsworth Prison, but already mentally unstable, he suffered a nervous breakdown. His medical report described him as a simple man of low intelligence. While Ron was in jail, Reg ran the Double R Club in Walthamstow. The name was derived from the twins' initials. The club was successful. Celebrities came to drink there. It helped that during the mid-50s, the East End was becoming fashionable. This was partly thanks to Diana Dawes, the blonde starlet seen here at the Odeon Theatre for a royal performance. Diana Dawes had starred in a film set in the East End called A Kid for Two Farthings. She would become a long-term friend of the Crays. Although Reg Cray looked respectable, he continued running the protection rackets. An army of spies reported back to the brothers, ensuring they had a good idea of what was happening around them. The Crays' gang was a loose affiliation of hangers-on and petty criminals, at the heart of the entourage was the firm, 12 to 15 villains. What bound these men to the craze was a fear of violence, particularly of Ron. But there was another reason for their respect. The 
Crays behaved like old East End governors. If a man went to prison, his family would be looked after and he would be compensated. This kind of behaviour won loyalty. As a result, they could rely on the East End wall of silence to steer clear of police attention. In the evenings, the twins would go to one of their East End pubs and buy drinks for other members of the firm. After a few hours of drinking, they would travel to a club in the West End for dinner. With the exception of the twins, the rest of the firm did not look or behave like the Mafia. There were no flash cars or expensively dressed women. Both Ron and Reg craved celebrity status. They would hang around with famous people and be seen to support local charities in the East End. They wanted recognition, but few of their crimes ever made the headlines. It was the crimes of others that dominated the news. In 1959, a detective was murdered in central London. Killing a policeman was still a capital offence. While there were fewer executions in the 1950s, they still took place. Although Ron held the view that coppers is dirt, neither he nor Reg ever attempted to kill a policeman. But while violent crime shocked ordinary people, it did not shock Ron. Quite the opposite. He was dangerous and violent himself and wanted to imitate the American gangsters he saw in the films. He wanted the firm to increase its business in Paddington and Notting Hill where rival gangs were making money from prostitution and rent rackets. By the late 50s, the Crays were involved in armed robbery, hijacking and arson. Robberies still grabbed the public imagination, but society was changing. And with change came new opportunities for criminals to make money. London was beginning to experience a cultural revival in the 1950s although it would not come to full fruition until the 1960s. In the 1950s, it was Soho that was the in place. Soho was home to a number of unlicensed gambling venues, many of which paid the twins protection money. Apart from the football pools and some licensed bookies, most gambling in Britain was illegal. But every year, some 10 to 15 million people placed bets on every sporting event going. The fact that gambling was illegal made it attractive to foreign criminal syndicates. In 1960, a number of slot machines were seized by police in New York. They had been destined for Britain and were almost certainly the work of the Mafia. But in 1961, the government passed the Gaming and Betting Act. The logic was that by legalising gambling, it could be better regulated. In fact, it merely made the criminals running and protecting the clubs even richer. With the help of Billy Hill, the craze moved in. Ron built up the firm to a level where he could mobilise 200 armed men within the hour. Reg stung the clubs in Knightsbridge, Chelsea and Mayfair. They would pay him up to 150 a week for protection. The name Cray was enough of an insurance policy for many. Their reputation for violence was due in large part to rumours about Ron's tendency to fly off the handle and slash people with razors or shoot them. But the legalisation of gambling clubs helped the Crays in a different way. The twins opened a club called Esmeralda's Barn in Wilton Place, just down the road from Harrods. Now they had the opportunity to rub shoulders with the smart set. Ron became friends with Lord Boothby. It would later be alleged that he and Ron were lovers. The early 60s was a good time for the twins. They looked and seemed respectable, at least in their own eyes. Esmeralda's barn was going well. The twins were working with a fraudster called Leslie Payne. A 
and his efforts were bringing them a huge income. In 1962, he made them over £100,000. The twins mixed with celebrities like Barbara Windsor. As Reg Cray would later write, they were the best years of our lives. We called them the swinging 60s. Me and my brother ruled London. We were untouchable. But it was not all smooth. In 1960, Reg had been convicted for demanding money with menace and had spent 18 months inside. While he was gone, Ron treated Esmeralda's barn as his own cash till, extending credit to whomever he pleased. The result was ruin. In 1963, the taxman was knocking on the door and the club folded. Worse was to come. On the 12th of July 1964, the Sunday Mirror ran a story alleging that a peer of the realm was having a homosexual affair with a gangster. Homosexuality was still illegal at the time. The paper did not name Lord Boothby. The gangster in question was Ronald Cray. The last thing the government wanted was a scandal, having already suffered from the Christine Keeler affair. Nor did the opposition want a scandal, because Tom Dryberg, a Labour MP, was also implicated with Ron. Boothby wrote a letter to the Times denying the claims. The Sunday Mirror backed down, apologised, and paid Boothby £40,000 in compensation. The scandal meant that the press was now very unlikely to portray the craze in a bad light. The television even interviewed Jack Spot Comer, the underworld king who had preceded the craze. Now, Jack Spot, good morning. You were once called the king of the underworld, I think. Yes, that's what the papers called me. Well, what was the underworld like in your time? Well, in my time, the, uh, the underworld was uh, governed by a mob that came from uh, a certain district in London. They were all aliens. And the, uh, when the war came, half of them was interned for being enemy aliens. Mm -hmm. The other half I demolished. How did you demolish them? Well, I had a bit of a reputation as a tough guy. I went to see them and then they all ran for their lives. And uh, afterwards, they paid me back by getting me done up, you know, years later. Yes, well, how many of them uh, well, were involved in that? When they well, came out of internment, was it? Well, when they came out of internment, uh, a few of the men's sons, mm. they got a bit older, and uh, they organised a mob to do me up one night. They sent three carloads after me, and of course that put me out of business. Now, what do you think of the protection racket nowadays? We've been told that there are two mobs or firms, or whatever you call them, who divide London between them. Is no. that right? Well, that's not right, no. There's uh, a number of gangs in London working the protection racket, and with the help that's been passed in Parliament with uh, the betting laws and the gambling laws, they've got it very easy. You mean that the law now makes things makes it easier for the protectionists? Well, of course. There's big money involved, you see, in these betting shops and these gambling clubs. Now, do these mobs, whether they're two of them or more than two of them, do they divide London geographically, or do, do they say, right, we look after betting shops, you look after striptease clubs? Oh, no, they mix it all together, mm. you see. They, uh, they put men in the striptease clubs, and the striptease club belongs to the gangs. Do the gangs so, fight and quarrel between each other at times? Oh, not now. There's too much money involved. As I said, if the gambling laws... If there would have been no uh, betting shops, and the gambling laws were different, because in my time everything was illegal, mm -hmm. you see, the uh, protection racket would die a natural death. In January 1965, the twins faced another test. Hugh McCown was the owner of the Hideaway Club in Soho. He complained to the police that the twins had sent a gangster called Mad Teddy Smith to smash up his club when he refused to pay protection. The case was given to two men, one of whom was Detective Inspector Leonard Reed, or Nipper Reed as he was nicknamed. The twins were arrested and put in Brixton jail. But the case fell apart. 
the twins had found out the names and addresses of the jury. In the 1960s, a jury had to be unanimous. At the trial, one of the jury voted in favour of the twins. The case collapsed, Nipper Reed was placed on other duties, and for the next three years, the twins were free of police investigation. First, a newspaper report had folded. Now a trial against them had collapsed. Not surprisingly, the Cray twins had become known as the Untouchables. It wasn't just clubs that the Crays milked for protection money. In 1960, Ron had squeezed the notorious slum landlord, Peter Rackman, for money. When Rackman's rent collectors were beaten up, he eventually agreed to give the Crays a percentage. Violent crime continued to make headlines. In 1963, a bomb was thrown through the window of a betting shop in Watley Street, the area that was a rival to the Cray's Patch. Scotland Yard prepared to move to new premises. But the Yard did not need new buildings. It needed a fresh drive. Too many of the officers on the Met were corrupt and quite prepared to turn a blind eye to organised crime. The Crays were at the peak of their success. In April 1965, Reg married Francis Shea at St James's Church in Bethnal Green. The marriage was a brief and unhappy one. It lasted a matter of weeks before Frances was back with her parents. Despite personal problems, the Crays were making plenty of money. One place they looked to invest it was in Nigeria, where Ron had dreams of building a city. The Nigerians gave Ron VIP treatment, but the idea was absurd. A Nigerian contractor demanded 5,000 from them and then had Leslie Payne imprisoned until it was paid. The Crays had dabbled in African investment and had had their fingers burned. But the Crays did not lose interest in foreign investments. For one thing, foreign investment was coming to London. In the 60s, London was firmly on the map as a place where it was happening. In 1966, for example, a British restaurant launched the first topless waitress. As moral codes were relaxed, London became a more attractive place for fun. Now that gambling laws had been relaxed, the Americans were keen to get involved. Mafia groups like the notorious Genovese family became tied in with London's gambling. In 1965, Representatives of the Mafia met the Crays. They told them that their plan was to fly in Americans for gambling parties and they expected no trouble. In return, the Crays would be paid protection money. This had the potential of big earnings and naturally, the Crays were keen to keep out their rival gang, the Richardsons. The Richardson brothers controlled an area of South London they were scrap metal merchants and earned a good income from their legitimate business. But they had a reputation for using torture. One of their number, Mad Frankie Fraser, seen here in 1997, was nicknamed the dentist because rumour had it that he pulled out people's teeth and gums with pliers. In 1965, the Crays met the Richardsons at the Astor Club to try and negotiate their differences. During this meeting, a man named George Cornell, an associate of the Richardsons, insulted Ron. Ron had already fallen out with Frankie Fraser. Now it was gang warfare. Every member of the firm was issued with a gun. The turf war started to heat up. First, the widow's pub in Tap Street was shot up. Then a man, who looked like Ron, was knocked down by a car on Valance Road. Then the Richardsons made a stupid mistake. They started a gunfight with a rival gang at Mr Smith's Club in Catford. During the gunfight, Richard Hart, an associate of the Crays, was killed. The Richardson gang 
was arrested on the 8th of March 1966. After a well-publicised trial, the Richardson gang were jailed. But now it was the turn of the craze to make a mistake. With the Richardsons out of the way, the craze could have run a tidy operation with the Americans. But Ron felt slighted by George Cornell, who had insulted him at the showdown with the Richardsons. He also wanted to avenge the death of Richard Hart. He could have done this by warning George Cornell. But Ron was mentally unstable, and now that he and Reg had beaten both the press and a police investigation, they thought that they were special. Therefore, on the day following the arrest of the Richardsons, he entered the Blind Beggar pub with Ian Barry. Barry claims he fired a shot at the ceiling. The barmaid ducked behind the bar and the other customers vanished. George Cornell was sitting at the bar. He had not been expecting trouble. Well, look who's here, he said. Ron pulled out a Luger and shot him in the face at point-blank range. Ian Barry drove him back to the Grave Morris pub by Whitechapel Underground Station, where Ron was sick. But the experience of killing had excited him. I just couldn't stop myself from hurting people. I've never felt so good before or since. Reg was shocked when the news was announced, but Ron was proud. I could feel everyone in the room, including Reg, looking at me with a new respect. I had killed a man. I was now the Colonel. Reg sent a message to the staff of the blind beggar, telling them to keep their mouths shut. When Ron was brought onto an identity parade, the barmaid deliberately avoided identifying him. The craze had got away with it again. The killing of Cornell had set a dangerous precedent. Some of the clubs offered to buy them out, preferring not to be associated with the twins. Up to now, the craze had threatened violence and issued beatings, but a public killing was new ground. The craze needed to pull off a publicity coup. They decided to help out Frank Mitchell. Mitchell was known as the Mad Axeman, he was a massive man of low intelligence who had a history of violence. He was desperate to get out of Dartmoor. On the 12th of December 1966, Albert Donahue and Mad Teddy Smith drove up to Dartmoor where Mitchell had escaped from a working party. They bundled him in the car and drove back to London. Mitchell was used to escaping. He had visited the local pubs and the prison warders had turned a blind eye each time, providing he always came back. But this one made the news. Bagpipes launched the second day of searching on Dartmoor as Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders joined the manhunt. They swept the one area near Lidford that was left unchecked overnight but drew a blank. Stories were circulating today that Mitchell had achieved an unusual degree of freedom even before his escape. Another prisoner, released three weeks ago, claimed that Mitchell was a lunchtime regular at a local pub. As the search on Dartmoor drew to an end, allegations of Mitchell's unescorted trips to local public houses were being checked by senior officers from the prison. One man they spoke to was the landlord of a public house at Peter Tavy, Mr Bob Roberts. Mr Roberts, are you sure that the prisoner drank in your pub? Oh, I'm pretty sure by the photograph there that I recognise the man. Oh, yes. Pretty certain that, says one of my customers. He was a big fellow. He was there, yes, definitely. Well, six foot one, oh, big yes. shoulders. Oh, yes, well-built chap. In fact, he boasted here about his strength. And they got us to feel the muscle on his arm at the top in the bar. That's why I more, more or less can say that is the man, yes. What did he say about his strength? Oh, we got talking, something about boxing and a bit of wrestling and things like that, and strength, you know. And, and then uh, he sort of flung his arm over the counter and said, we'll fill those arms, you know. While the police and troops combed to Dartmoor, Mitchell was tucked up in a London flat. Teddy Smith then wrote a letter to the Times offering to return Mitchell to Dartmoor if the prison authorities would reconsider his sentence and secure a release date. But nothing happened. 
the last thing the authorities were going to do was be bargained with. Not least, because towards the end of the month, there was a separate, unconnected prison break from Dartmoor. Mitchell was getting restless and demanding to see the craze. They sent him a woman called Lisa to keep him entertained, but it was clear they now had a problem on their hands. How could they hide this restless, violent giant of a man? At this time, Frances, Reg's estranged wife, was suffering a mental breakdown, so Ron was effectively in charge of the firm. On the 23rd of December, a van was waiting in Ladysmith Avenue near Mitchell's safe house. Frank Donahue told Mitchell that he was going to spend Christmas in the countryside with Ronnie. Donahue got into the front of the van and drove it away. Inside the back of the van was Freddie Foreman and Alfie Gerard. They shot Mitchell. The killing took somewhere between 16 and 18 bullets. Although he always denied it, the order to kill had almost certainly come from Ron. The van stopped and Donahue walked home. The disappearance of Mitchell remained a mystery for years. The twins were acquitted of his murder on insufficient evidence. But in January 2000, on primetime television, Freddie Foreman confessed to the... Who was Frank Mitchell's final executioner? I was, actually. For a while, the firm returned to business as usual. The twins continued to make money from their protection rackets and slot machines. On the surface, their power in London remained unchallenged. But the firm was nothing without the twins. And in the end, they were agents of their own destruction. Reg wanted to be a criminal businessman. Ron was always the one who veered towards violence. But then something happened which plunged Reg into an abyss of depression, drugs and drink. In June 1967, Reg's wife Frances committed suicide. Reg was overcome with grief. He would frequently sit at a graveside, talking and weeping. Reg became increasingly violent and unpredictable, just like his brother. He shot a friend in the leg in front of his family on account of an imagined insult. Then he met a man called Fields in the Starlight Club in Highbury and demanded he give him a thousand pounds. As Fields did not have the money, Reg shot him in the leg. But the downfall came with the killing of Jack the Hat McVitty. Jack McVitty had been asked to kill Leslie Payne. Reg believed Payne was talking to the police. Reg's hunch was correct. But McVitty had failed to kill Payne. He had simply kept the money. Worse still, McVitty was frequently drunk and insulted Reg on several occasions. On the 28th of October 1967, Jack McVitty was invited to a party at 65 Evering Road, Stoke Newington. When he entered the house, Reg tried to shoot him with a Mauser, but the gun would not go off. Reg then pulled out a knife and stabbed him repeatedly. At the time, Reg was on a cocktail of drugs and alcohol and was suffering from depression. He had no real need to kill McVitie, but as he later wrote from prison, I did not regret it at the time, and I don't regret it now. The law was beginning to close in. Reg was right that Leslie Payne was talking to the police. In 1967, Sir Joseph Simpson had died and there was a change of personnel at Scotland Yard. Leonard Reed was brought back in and given the task of dealing with the craze because the CID was so corrupt. Reed assembled a team and ran it from a separate building called Tintagel House. Reed went to see Leslie Payne. As Payne was under death threat from the twins, he talked. He gave Reed enough names for a witness list. Reed then persuaded the Home Office to grant amnesty to the witnesses for their crimes in exchange for cooperation. By 1968, the face of the old East End was changing. 
The Crays were now staying at their parents' flat in a new construction called Bunhill Row. Valance Road, like so many other parts of Victorian London, had been condemned and was awaiting demolition. The firm was falling apart. While Ron was confident that the police were not clever enough to catch them, Rage was worried about Nipper Reed. There were rumours of spies in the firm. Then mad Teddy Smith disappeared. He had been talking about Frank Mitchell in the local pub, and he was summoned to see the craze at Valance Road. After that, he went missing. So did another man named Frost. Other people who fell out with the twins had their lives cut short. A man named Tony Mafia was found shot at the wheel of his car. Another acquaintance, Jack Buggy, was pulled out of the sea at Brighton. The craze had been liaising with the Mafia, including a man named Alan Cooper, who was a double agent for the FBI. The FBI were hoping that they could use the craze to incriminate the Mafia. Through Alan Cooper, the craze had been handling stolen bonds from America. As Leslie Payne was the accountant, he knew all the details of this, and Nipper Reed had enough evidence to arrest them. Now came another breakthrough. Alan Cooper offered to supply the twins with dynamite. Ron sent Tom Cowley to Scotland to pick it up. Nipper Reed was tipped off by a friend of Leslie Payne's and Reed arrested Tom Cowley red-handed. Nipper Reed decided it was now time to catch the twins. At 6 a.m. on the 8th of May 1968, Reed and his team burst into houses across London to arrest members of the firm. Eight weeks later, the Crays were taken to a committal hearing before the Old Street Magistrate, Frank Milton. They were accused of protection rackets, trafficking stolen bonds, connections to the New York Mafia, and the murders of Cornell, McVitie and Mitchell. The twins were refused bail and were sent to Brixton Jail. Leonard Reed broke down the East End Wall of Silence. 28 people brokered deals with the police to give testimony. On the 7th of January 1969, the trial commenced. It would prove to be a long and expensive case. The Crays were taken by an armed police convoy from Brixton to the Old Bailey, and the route was kept secret until the last possible moment, a precaution normally reserved for Mafia criminals in the USA. In the dock, were the leading members of the firm. Giving evidence against them was Ronald Hart, the twin's cousin, who was present at the killing of Jack McVitie. Reed had even managed to get the barmaid from the blind beggar to give evidence. The twins were given 30 years each and were separated. Ron was sent to Durham Jail. Reg was sent to Parkhurst Prison in the Isle of Wight. The twins suffered from depression and in 1972 they were reunited at Parkhurst. But when Reg attacked and nearly killed a fellow prisoner, they were separated permanently. In 1978, Ron suffered a breakdown and was transferred to Broadmoor. In August 1982, the twins were briefly reunited. Their mother Violet had died of cancer and they were allowed to attend her funeral. The prisoners were deliberately handcuffed to the tallest prison guard to make them appear small. But the East End turned out in full and the security arrangements alone cost the taxpayer £30,000. It was a reminder of the old East End and the old world of crime. Armed robber John McVicker, once regarded by the police as Britain's most wanted man, was there in person, and so was Diana Dawes, who went to visit Ronnie in Broadmoor at his mother's request. 
It was said that Violet didn't know until the trial the extent of her son's criminal activities. Charlie Cray was sentenced to seven years as an accomplice to murder at that trial, which ended the brothers' reign as kings of the London underworld in a period which had seen murders, maimings, racketeering and inter-gang feuding. But many sides of East End society turned up today. At the end of the short service, the twins were taken back to their cells without having seen their mother buried. Reggie was the first to leave. He's not due to be released until 1999. And then came Ronnie with the same tight security. Both men have recently won certificates behind bars for religious knowledge. Diana Dawes was at the graveside. How well did she know the twins' mother? Well, I didn't know her very well, but I, I knew her slightly. And what little I knew of her, I had great respect for her because... Um, first and foremost, she was a mum. <laughs> Seven months later, their father died. There was no elaborate funeral, and the twins did not attend. <laughs> Occasionally, the craze came back to the public eye. Diamond and Ruby. Ron Cray married while in prison. Then, on the 16th of March, 1995, Ron suffered a heart attack. He died the next day. But perhaps the last chapter of the gangster's life was most accurately illustrated by these pictures inside Broadmoor. The small cell where Ronnie Cray spent the years of incarceration. And the man himself, prematurely aged by the drugs he was being treated with, and according to a journalist he befriended, regretting the wasted years. The actress Barbara Windsor, an old friend of the craze, said today she was saddened by the circumstances of his death. I am sad because 28 years to be in Broadmoor is a very long time and I know they were looking forward to coming out and, and spending their last years in the country. The funeral became a state occasion for the East End. Hundreds lined the streets to pay their respects. A mixture of old East Enders and those who were simply curious. Well, he's a good brother, and he's very loyal, and he's very generous. And, um, he had lots of nice ways about him, and um, I should always remember him um, with good memories, you know. And um, uh, I know he's at peace. That's the main thing. He's at peace. Reg even arranged for a Spitfire to fly over the grave and dip its wings. This was a little ironic, given that their father had avoided fighting in the war, and that the twins had been dishonorably discharged from the military. The funeral brought the Cray legend back to the surface and the television channels were interviewing everyone. But it was not long before there was another Cray back in jail. The following year, Charlie Cray was arrested for his involvement in a multi-million pound drug deal. The one Cray who had stayed out of the media spotlight was now firmly back in it. 70-year-old Cray, seen here on the left with Reggie during their brother Ronnie's funeral last year, is being questioned about an £80 million cocaine smuggling ring. Among those offering testimony to Charlie's good character was mad Frankie Fraser. He had made his peace with the Crays while in jail, and they had become friends. Charlie Cray, he said, was in a completely different class. He's a coward, too nice a man to steal a penny, too honest to be trusted by other crooks. That's how Fraser described Cray. Indeed, the criminal-turned-East London tour guide claimed the prosecuting counsel was more likely to be involved in drugs than Cray. Charlie Cray denies one charge of offering to supply £39 million worth of cocaine and a second count alleging he provided two kilograms of the drug. Charlie Cray was an old, broken man. His only son had died from cancer the previous year. Now he was being sentenced to 12 years, having been caught out by undercover officers. In July 1997, the same month in which Charlie was sentenced, Reg Cray married Roberta Jones. Reg had served the 30-year sentence, but his attempts to gain parole were met with refusal. The notorious East End criminal is not being freed. His new wife, Roberta, who he married last year inside the prison walls, says she's heartbroken. I think it is just incredibly unfair and I think the reasons given by the parole board are just astounding. I think they're misleading and I think they're 
on many points they're factually incorrect. The parole board lists six reasons for its decision not to recommend Cray for release or more open conditions. It says in its report, a failure to refrain from drinking is noted and that this failure and attitudes associated with it are seen as risk factors. It also refers to concerns about manipulative and devious attitudes and concludes, these accumulated factors indicate that the risk is too high for release or a move to open conditions at this stage. 30 years was the minimum period set. Uh, Mr Cray has a, a long a reputation as a man of violence and having been a gangland boss, uh, I think I'm happy to rely on the parole board to decide when uh, they should recommend to the Home Secretary that he should be released. Then another family tragedy gave him one more taste of the outside world. In March 2000, Charlie Cray died in prison. He had requested a quiet funeral, but Reg went for a rerun of Ronnie's grandiose send-off. The crowds gathered at Charlie's funeral had little idea that within a matter of months they would be witnessing another. Gangster Reggie Cray is today awaiting test results after being taken ill at his Norfolk jail. The gangland killer is said to be recovering in a local hospital after exploratory surgery. Reg was diagnosed with aggressive cancer. On the 26th of August, he was granted his freedom on compassionate grounds. They should have done it 10 years ago even 20 years ago and that's what makes it so sad they've left it all this time when he's literally on his deathbed freedom for the man perhaps more feared than loved in his time might have come too late for a final homecoming the end came on the 2nd of october the east end once again saw its own state funeral for reg but the crowds were a little thinner it was as though he was less interesting in death than he was in life. A smattering of old EastEnders and members of the criminal fraternity paid their respects. Many in the crowd had been children when the Crays were jailed. The funeral procession made its way through an East End that had been changed beyond recognition. Hackney, a former stamping ground, was now gentrified. Shigwell, was now multiracial. Reg was arguably the last echo of an East End that was now nothing more than a memory. While the craze had been inside, the world had moved on. Despite his great coup in bringing down the craze, Nipper Reed was not given a top job in the Met. Instead, he was made Assistant Chief Constable of Nottingham. Perhaps this was no bad thing. In the 1970s, the full scale of corruption in the Met came to light. The world of crime also changed. Towards the end of the 1960s, when the craze went inside, drugs were starting to become big money. Drugs would completely change the dynamics of the crime scene. The changes in crime would make the 1960s look idyllic to some. The craze became seen as the Robin Hoods of the East End. Rough men with hearts of gold. The type of men who only picked on other criminals and looked after their patch. Who helped out others when they were in trouble. They never hurt elderly people or hurt children. It was only gang warfare, that's all. He only killed here these own people, like, you know, the gangs and that. But um, apart from that, they're very good. They kept the area clean. And they, you, you, if they were here today, you, you, you wouldn't have had no muggers or, or, no, or nothing like that. It is true that the Crays largely confined their activities to other criminals. But their fraud lost honest businesses thousands of pounds. And while some shopkeepers in the East End went to them for protection, there were many more who breathed a sigh of relief when the Crays were locked away. The Crays were genuine in their desire to help charities in the East End, but they were quite happy to profit from Peter Rackman's rent racket. And by doing so, they were gaining from the misery of their fellow East Enders who lived in such shocking squalor. The Crays were, quite simply, contradictory men. 
they were mentally unstable and prone to horrendous acts of torture. In the end, they destroyed themselves, and in doing so, they paid a heavy price. Reg would later write the following words from jail. I have paid the greatest price of all. Hanging would have been preferable to the hell I've been through for the past 20 years. We're dinosaurs. We'd be eaten alive by the new young men who now control British crime. It's a different world to what it was in 1969. videos available for view. There's also thousands of images in the photos sections. The link for the group is in the YouTube description section. I hope we see you there soon.